52 Sketches Podcast, Episode 8, Rock Musician Armando Posada. Welcome to 52 Sketches, a podcast about creativity and creative practices. Here's your host, Rob Head. Welcome to the 52 Sketches Podcast. I am your host, Rob Head. Today, I am delighted to have on the show an old friend and collaborator, musical artist, and radio personality, Armando Posada. Armando Posada is a songwriter, guitarist, rock producer, tireless champion of rock and espanol, and a radio show host. So welcome, Armando. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. This has been a really exceptional year with the COVID-19 pandemic, and and so I, I want to start just by checking in, uh, you know, person to person. How you doing? I'm doing well, uh, as, as well as anybody would be doing during this crazy year, if, if you want to yeah. put it that way. Yeah. And fam's okay, uh, both here and elsewhere? Yeah. My mother had COVID uh, at the beginning in March, and then she survived it. And then we were able to see her. And of course, you know, now she's recovered and she's doing better. But it's a very, it's a very real thing COVID and I think mm-hmm. it's uh, it's amazing that people believe it to be a fraud or a hoax or like mm-hmm. an imaginary flu or something like that and I guess uh, some people just have to get it in order to believe it you know yeah that is uh, one of the disturbing dimensions of this whole thing right wow yeah well I'm so glad your mom is is recovered yeah me too thank you yeah yeah you know I like to think of creativity like a superpower that some of that we all have, you know, but some of us explore it. And so I want to paint a picture of your backstory as an artist. If you were the main character in a novel or a superhero comic or something, let, you know, let's tell your backstory. So what was your childhood like? And did your early experiences build toward becoming an artist? Well, listen, I, I want to point out something since you're in that topic of what is creativity, right? Yeah, yeah, please. I used to teach pre-K back in the uh, uh-huh. early 90s. And I, uh, my whole major was early childhood education. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember that clearly one of the topics of this conversation had a lot to do with uh, some of the college um, courses that we took, where we would mm-hmm. discuss what is creativity and how does it compare to intelligence. Mm-hmm. Intelligence mm-hmm. Is, is sort of formulated in a way from what we understood as something that can be taught, learned, and sort mm-hmm. of, you know, practiced like sequenced Mm -hmm. right whereas Mm -hmm. creativity Mm -hmm. we couldn't really teach it was something that was almost inherited it was uh creating dynamic thinking in complex ways and being able to express and formulate new ideas within that realm so it was almost like creating universes and so Uh i always thought as creative people were not necessarily those people you could teach but they're definitely people that could figure things out in ways that other you know, like intelligence couldn't couldn't mm-hmm, formulate mm-hmm. in the same way. So let's just say, for argument's sake, that everybody's creative, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so we all have that superpower, but it mm-hmm. takes something very, very important. Uh, whereas kryptonite, let's let's say the kryptonite in, in each one of us is other or other vices, other forms of thinking. For example, you could be very creative, but you never really dealt into the creativity because you're more of a abstract, not an abstract, but more of a conscious black and white kind of person that sees and hears. Mm-hmm. And, and what I'm getting at is that for you to be able to express creativity, sometimes it takes something traumatic and that trauma, mm-hmm. that trauma that is created allows you to say, okay, something here is wrong. And mm-hmm. it's so powerful that it actually, it, it, it almost allows you to unleash it. Mm-hmm. So the most creative people I've ever, I, you know, I think the world has ever seen, like Dolly, like, uh, let's just say Kurt, Kurt Cobain, John Lennon, um, mm. those people tortured, had... Tortured souls. Uh-huh. To, exactly. They had something very traumatic that happened in their lives, and somehow that unleashed a power. And mm-hmm. so I think it is important to find what it is that, that makes you passionate, because mm-hmm. that will unleash the already... I would say, inherited creativity that each person uh, has. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I want to drill down on the, the kids angle because I think, you know, having taught young children, you you probably uh, saw what most of us see, which is that 
most or all of them have that innate desire to create things and make things and build things and that we sort of punish it out of them over time. We do. We do. And, you know, yeah, we do. Yeah. We, we, we basically, we create in them, we dwarf their creativity because they have to fit a role. They have to fit, mm-hmm. fit, fit like a mold in what we create, you know, we talk about as mm-hmm. far as grades and achievement goals. And so we say, if you're smart for second grade, you've got to know these benchmarks. And so we're yeah. so busy creating these benchmarks and l- making sure that children live up to those benchmarks that we don't stop and say, well, wait a minute, Johnny really doesn't give a shit about benchmarks. He's more about what is the color mm-hmm. of each cloud? What is the shape of each cloud? What is the what is the formation of all those little sand sculptures that he's building? And so right. we kill the daydreamers. We kill the dreamers. We're constantly... Mm-hmm you know, bashing them and saying, you can't dream, you can't create, you can't be artistic, you can't mm. explore, you can't be imaginative. You've got to make sure you right. get your A's and B's. So right. Right. for me, the, the simplest way I can describe my childhood is I was very creative. And thank God that my mother allowed that creativity to flourish. Mm-hmm. She allowed me to play a lot. Uh, there was a lot of play in my in my which is one of the reasons why I'm not worried about the youth because they're all on iPhones or on some sort of a media format. Mm-hmm. But back in our youth, we actually, you know, we had time to play with Star Wars figures and go outside and play with our friends and sit around in color or paint mm-hmm. or whatever. So I had a lot of time for that. Throw balls around, play with sticks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we had a lot of time yeah. to formulate games and, and ideas and create puzzles and, and I think the traumatic moment was when um, my father was a catalyst. He was a mm-hmm. he was a tough man. He was a tough dad, and mm-hmm. he he left us uh, when I was young. And so uh, that turbulent relationship that I had with him was the beginning of a lot mm-hmm. of other traumatic, I would say, experiences that I had growing up, which again allowed the box to get opened, and then all these other like emotions to come out, which were important in creativity, like anger. Right. Like uh-huh. hurt, like passion, you know, um, oh, passion yeah. is a result of that. But anger, hurt, uh, sorrow, um, dismay, all those terms mm-hmm. that we use so freely, when you actually mm-hmm. feel them, it actually becomes sort of like your your green lantern, if you will. Mm. Mm. Talk to me a little bit more about your childhood. Did, did you do specific mediums as a child or was it just sort of a generally creative? Like, did you do music, visual art, writing, cooking? You know, what, like, what were you doing? How, I, did, well, how did it manifest? I, I remember I used to, me and my cousins and our neighbors, they would always play, um, we'd always pretend to air rock, you know, air guitar. <laughs> right, right, right. And so... I had a gift for imitating a lot of young, a lot of artists. So I would grab my mm-hmm. tennis racket and pretend that I was, you know, I don't know, the Beatles or whoever. Mm-hmm. And so I started performing for the kids in the neighborhood by pretending okay. to be an artist. And where uh, is this? Where is this? It, all in Chicago. Okay. So um, I started creating these little gangs of friends that would like watch me perform. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I felt really comfortable doing that. And then that Mm -hmm. became acting, which at that point, you know, uh, I was always sort of the class clown. If if there was something that needed to be done in the classroom to get attention, I was kind of like the guy who would do it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so uh, getting attention was important because I was looking for validation as a young child, because, again, my father's, you know, uh, lack of relationship. So validation was important. And by finding it, I found that by performing and acting funny and being reckless and being rebellious, I was going to get it. And so right. That was important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, in those formative years, did you have teachers, mentors, models that helped you on that road? Some, but not not yeah. many. Some. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say my fourth grade teacher, my sixth grade teacher, and my seventh grade teacher were very important in in helping mature the creative side of of my mm-hmm. personality. Mm-hmm. My fourth mm-hmm. grade teacher was the first person that ever introduced me to the opera and classical music. And that was really important because mm-hmm. up until that moment, I didn't understand that music. And she was able to make it, not dumb it down, but make it familiar, make it more, <laughs> right. you know, to not fit so into, foreign. Right. 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 Yeah. 
my sixth grade teacher, I remember we used to, that was a, that was the height of break dancing. So uh -huh, for some uh -huh. weird reason, she would allow us to battle break dance battle in the classroom. And so we wow. were like, okay, yeah. let's let's dance. So it, we would pull push the desk apart, and it mm -hmm. like create this circle in the middle of the classroom. And then the kids who had a new move would come in and break dance. And it was like mm -hmm. she was allowing a sort of city, sort of uh, urban expression to be celebrated and at the same time celebrating each other for the things that we knew how to do and it felt really mm. good to share this with street you know like these street values with other kids and mm -hmm. uh, not feel embarrassed well, about it yeah that's really extraordinary for a teacher you know normally you think of uh, of american education as being sort of a normalizing influence you know everyone is being pushed towards being uh employable and part of the dominant culture and um, and it sounds like, you know, you had moments in your, in your education in Chicago where, where the teachers were allowing you to say, Hey, uh, you know, express, you know, what you're experiencing in, in this neighborhood <laughs> yeah. you know, and who you yeah. are, you know? Exactly. So it was yeah. funny. And, yeah. and that my seventh grade teacher was the first person that ever allowed me to act and be in the, like in the, in the theater play. So all okay. of a sudden we went from classical music to dancing to now acting. And it was like all mm -hmm. these different teachers were, were creating this little performer, if you will. Mm -hmm. So by eighth grade, I was already acting. I was already, I knew how to dance. I also knew how to perform in front of people. And, mm -hmm. and I also had a, an appreciation for all types of music, not just, you know, rock or, you know, um, street music, if you will, like rap and, and, and hip hop, but also, classical music and jazz and even blues. Right. Right. Uh, we didn't meet in Chicago. So, so where did your life go from there? Well, you know, I think that nothing's an accident. I think things happen sort of like the way they're supposed to happen. Kind of mm -hmm. like, they're not like back to the future formulated where <laughs> you go back and you change your, your dad's, you know, situation all of a sudden everything works out the way it should. I think we have to suffer. I think we have to go through a sort of sort of like a, mm. a rite of passage kind of, you know, where we get our hearts broken, we mm -hmm. suffer, we cry, we, we learn to be alone, we learn to challenge ourselves. And then um, all these things happen and, and they create the person that you are. And so uh, what happened was that I was I was I had a, a high school sweetheart and I was really mm -hmm. in love with her. And, mm -hmm. you know, I tried to break up with her when she went to college and she didn't want to. And eventually she ended up, you know, kind of being uh, uh, unfaithful, if you will. Okay. So that was my second really pivotal moment in life where, you know, you have your father and you have your mm -hmm. high school sweetheart, mm -hmm. which is the first love wow. you ever have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was ready to run away from Chicago. I was tired of it. All I saw there was heartache and sadness and isolation <laughs> and, so I'm like, screw so this. So you were looking for a new, a new, new, new beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I was. And yeah. so I came to Maryland to study more than anything else. And mm -hmm. it just ends up that you meet one guy who meets another guy who meets another guy. Before you know it, you're in this rock band and you're like, you know, how did I get here? <laughs> and it's almost like a talking head song. And it's like, you know, uh, was yeah. this my life? And, and it is all these, <laughs> all these things happened exactly the way they were supposed to happen and right. that's, that's how it turned out that i was here and i mm -hmm. met you yeah uh, you know a lot of um what i know about your musical life it has been enmeshed with an, another musical friend of ours a uh, mutual friend named javier garavito and you had a band together uh called Ecote uh, that had some early success and you uh, you know i know uh, you recently collaborated on re-recording some reimagined versions of the songs you wrote mm -hmm. you know back in the day so how did that collaboration you know turn into a band and 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 sort of that flowering of your, your songwriting you know life okay so when people say i want to song write i think you know we go back to well what is it that you're what is it that you want to do uh mm -hmm. if people who say i want to paint that's great but what are you painting what's your motivation right. i always about think what yeah yeah it's like you gotta yeah. you can't be seinfeld the show's got to be about something and if it's yeah. about, yeah, yeah. And if it's about nothing, fine. But songwriting mm -hmm. is a little bit more intimate. You, you, you want to just, you, you, the, the greatest songwriters I've ever been influenced by had something mm -hmm. very powerful to say. And that mm -hmm. lasting mm -hmm. message, you can, you can listen to it every single decade and it still means something. 
Mm -hmm. So sure. How does that begin? I think one of the things that helped me become a songwriter was I was poetic. I used to write mm -hmm. a lot of poetry. So I had like these books of poems. And so when I met Javier, it was by chance. I was buying guitar strings. He was working at a okay. music store and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we needed a bassist on this current band that I was in. So because he spoke Spanish and it was a Spanish rock band, it was like, oh, okay, well, you know, this is simple. You play bass, you speak Spanish, you're Spanish, join the band. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening was that our chemistry was, was much more, I guess, in sync with each other than it was with the singer and guitarist of the band. And so we the decided, previous band. yeah, so we decided to break uh -huh. away from the band and started a, a, a different project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think the success of that band had a lot to do with uh, the energy we put into it, the amount of time mm -hmm. we put into it, and also the, um, the sacrifices that we made, which all these things mm -hmm. combined don't always necessarily guarantee success. Mm -hmm. That's what's sure. so weird about the music business. It's like no other business in the world. You can put everything you want into it, invest everything you have, and it does not guarantee success. Whereas if you go to work, you work really hard, you get a promotion, you get a raise, you might even mm -hmm. end up owning part of the shares of the company, even owning the company. But in music, mm -hmm. that will never happen in that sort of uh, guaranteed way. Right, right. It's sort of a uh, lightning in a bottle. Like there's this, you know, if you're the, in the right place at the right time with the right sound, with the right people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that, that partnership with Javier, you are coming up as a, this uh, sort of passionate, poetic kid from Chicago. And if I, you know, wanted to paint this, uh, as a contrast, I would say Javier was coming up from a, from a, um, happy home, more <laughs> trained, you know, he's more technical, more trained. Uh, how would you say it? Oh, he, he was much more musically, uh, gifted. He, he was definitely much more musically gifted. He'd also had gotten uh, music lessons, piano lessons. He had a time to, when, when you have a, a safe environment or, or a loving environment, you have time mm -hmm. to dabble in more things without the need of pressure to survive. You right. know, when, when I was growing up, that was, that was my whole point was survival. I mean, whether it was because my parents were divorced and my mother had no income or I was mm -hmm. living on my mm -hmm. own and I had to work and go to school. There was always this need to survive. And then somewhere in mm -hmm. that need, you wanted to be an artist. And so it, it, you can fuel the artist, but you still have to eat. But right. if you have right. all things sort of sort of in, in, in comfort and you're mm -hmm. given certain privileges, sure. there's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But it's going to help fuel, you know, um, the magic. You'll the, have more, privilege, more, uh, more opportunities. You'll have yeah. more opportunities. And he did. And yeah. he took advantage of them. And they were great. Because if mm -hmm. I came in with the soul and the lyrics and the melodies, he had the musical talent. He had the understanding of musical composition. And so what mm -hmm. I had was limited because I had, I had really written songs, even though I was in college taking music theory. But working with him and learning, you know, kind of how he did things, it helped mm -hmm. me become mm -hmm. a better songwriter. Yeah. You know, what I remember from those days was that the two of you sort of needed each other you know, yeah. <laughs> equally in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, I was listening to an interview with uh, Andy Grammer, who's a pretty successful artist these days. And he was saying, you know, his childhood was idyllic uh, <laughs> and that, uh, you know, part of his journey to becoming a real artist was figuring out like life isn't awesome for everyone all the time, you know? Right. And, you know, I think of that a little bit, you know, the combination of, or the collaboration of an artist who's coming at it from a uh, primarily emotional level. And then another artist is coming at it from primarily a craft level is a really nice partnership to shoot for. And I always felt that that was uh, exactly what the, the, the two of you uh, had going with Equité. That was really a, uh, uh, a moment in time, you know, it was things come together. Yeah, it was. I was his yeah. uh, Lennon to his Paul or his David <laughs> to his uh, Roger, you know, but we worked yeah. in sync and we knew each other uh -huh. uh, artistically, almost emotionally mm -hmm. to uh, the mm -hmm. point where, you know, we didn't finish each other's thoughts, but musically we could finish each other's train of thought. Songs. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Yeah. As your life sort of continued on, um, how did you find continuing channels of expression? How did how did you organize your life so that you could continue to be creative? You know, over the years that have followed. 
Well, you take breaks, obviously, because I don't. I think you're full of shit if you think you're going to write a new song every day. I think you have mm-hmm. to live life in order to bring life into music. Okay. Yeah, this goes back to what you were saying a few minutes ago. You know, back in the day when we were undergrads together, I was a dance major. I don't know if you remember that, but I uh, do. And and one of the things that uh, drove me crazy was was people would make dances about dance you know like they, were, they had nothing to say you know? right right and uh and there's a certain balance and this has come up you know in other episodes of the podcast you know there, there has you have to have something to say you know you have to some live some life that has some yeah meaning, I don't, there's know? no doubt there's no doubt yeah so yeah. life happens when you're busy planning life which is a famous lenin quote but it's true right right so what happens after Equite, uh i started working with a female singer and we kept mm-hmm. doing spanish rock but in, the, in between that and all the way through that, I'm getting married. I'm having children. I'm mm-hmm, living mm-hmm. life. I'm surviving. Again, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so music doesn't become the forefront anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, there's an illusion and a disillusion about it. You realize that the people that, that thought that you were the greatest, mm-hmm. you, they never want to see you again. And I'm talking uh, about the music business. We're not talking about Javier. We're talking about the music business in general. You know, they tell you you're the greatest, you're the greatest, you guys are it, you're, you're it. And then all of a sudden, uh-huh. they don't know you anymore. So, right. So, there's sort of a, an opportunism um, in yeah, the relationship. A real yeah. education, if you will, about what's real yeah. and what isn't. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you, I kept the craft, I kept writing, I kept producing. And then, production comes into songwriting as a natural mm-hmm. evolution of any artist. You don't just write anymore. You don't just compose. Now all of a sudden you're starting to give it style and flavor. Right. And so you give that about 10 years, you're no longer writing the way you used to write. You're not producing the way you used to produce. Now your production has become much more um, eloquent, complex, mm-hmm. colorful. Yeah. And your writing is even mm-hmm. can even take that sort of new shape of the compositions aren't just basic chord progressions anymore. They seem to, you know, have a little bit more, not psychedelic, but mm-hmm. like different mm-hmm. feels to them, which mm-hmm. right. can be a, a larger palette. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know, things like digital audio workstations become just standard part of the uh, tool set that you have. It's mm-hmm. not, you know, you're not just playing your guitar into a four track. You're <laughs> right. You're. <laughs> You're sort of by necessity now a recording studio and a producer and, you know, all of those things because the, everything's been moved into, you know, the bedroom or the studio in the house. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah. so I don't think anybody who's serious about music can just go into a guitar center and buy a guitar and say, that's it. I'm going to write songs. I think you have to look into it like, OK, the music business has changed. No one's mm-hmm. going to give you a contract and say, well, we're going to take care of you. Unless, you know, you're, she, what, what's this guy's name? Uh, the English guy? Sorry, Ed, Ed Sheeran. Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. Yeah, Ed Sheeran, yeah, yeah, yes. Just the, one of the, the yeah. top songwriters in the world. Yeah. 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 They're not going to give you a studio and just say, well, just come on in. We're going to write, you know, three albums. We're going we're gonna to we're gonna produce and fund three albums for you. It's not going to happen. Like it was 40 years ago or 50 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. You know what you are? Right. You're an indie guy. And an indie guy yeah. means you do it all. You do it from right. start to finish, mm-hmm. everything. And then that means so you that, have to sort of craft your lifestyle around making that possible. Yeah. Financially, that's the hardest thing for any artist because it mm-hmm. takes a lot of money. And uh, of course, it takes a lot of time, but you have mm-hmm. to fund the craft with mm-hmm. something else. You know, you can't just fund it yeah. out of love. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. everybody has a day yeah. job, and every night job is working on music. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Finding that balance, finding a way to keep that um, alive and keep, you know, being an, uh, a, a working artist, even if it's not paying the bills, uh, is is a constant struggle that I hear over and over again. But it's uh, the kind of thing that you have to find ways to make it make it balance out. You know, there's only so many hours in the day. And so there's sacrifices. You know, you can't uh, do that and spend four hours a day watching TV or, you know, what's something like that. Yeah. No, no. TV is yeah. the worst. It's the end of TV <laughs> and, com- and compl- complacency and happiness. Comfort. In fact, yeah. comfort. they're comfort, the enemies yeah. of, of artists. Those are the uh-huh. things that you can't fuel an artist with. You have to fuel an artist with what are the things that fuel us? 
again, disillusion, mm. uh, re re rebellion. You know, uh, we yeah. go on and on yeah. with all these yeah. anti-mainstream feelings, <laughs> but none of yeah. them, none of them are happiness. If you, right. if you, yeah. you're a singer about happy happiness, you're going to be singing kids' songs, in my opinion. Right. You know? Yeah. My my uh, dance training comes back because I, I remember a uh, Martha Graham, who was a choreographer and, and uh, uh, brilliant artist of the 20th century. She 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 called that divine dissatisfaction. Like I'm not happy with how things are, and so I create. You know. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. As I understand it, you have a radio show now, and I, I want to talk about how you got there and what you're doing, and you know what motivates that. And tell us about that. What's that journey like? So basically, I was I was writing an album. I had finished an album with a Spanish singer. Okay. Uh, he and I. Is this just, in your home studio or somewhere else? Yeah, home studio. So okay. I just finished an album with the guy, and so somehow we found out that locally there was a radio station that had a program at night for Spanish rock. Somehow okay. he got an interview for us, and we got into the radio station. They played one or two of our songs. And he spoke to us, and I was very happy about that. You know, it was like, okay, mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm. We don't have to kiss anybody's ass to be here. So after the show, I don't know, maybe I was very colorful during the interview. I don't know. But he said to me, <laughs> you know, you're very, uh, you've got a really good, I don't know, he might have said radio voice or attitude about music or no knowledge about sure. music. But he sure. said, I would like you to consider being my sub. Okay. And I said, well, okay, does that mean that you are going to not show up once in a while and I have to take over the radio program? He said, yes. Okay. I spoke to my wife about it and she said, oh, sounds like an interesting situation if you can do it. Right. Well, I did it. And it was funny because the first night that I did it, he didn't show up. He was supposed to be there to hold my hand. He didn't show up. So I had to run the whole program by myself. And it was very, he, I fire. mean, yeah, it was really scary, man. I've never known pressure like that. I thought playing in front of people was scary, but no. I mean, being in the radio, on like the people are holding on to your words, uh -huh, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I was, I was like, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to sound stupid? I don't know. So luckily for me, I had a nice set list. I played more music than talked, but when I did talk, okay. it was more like you know introducing myself, who I was. The next Saturday, he didn't show up again. But it was, I was starting to think, okay, I'll try this again. And, and it worked out again. You know, I didn't die. Then he shows up. Right. And we started, uh, he started depending on me to sort of come up with the music and the interviews. Okay. So uh -huh. what he would do is, he, he's, he's funny because he would, he would actually just show up just to be the lead guy. And I was doing okay. all the behind the scenes work. Sure. And at some point that gets a little tiresome because, you know, when you do all the work, you want to be in charge of the program, meaning it should be your sure. name first. But it was mm -hmm. his name first. And I thought, well, mm -hmm. he did give me the opportunity, then fine. Well, what happened was sure. he, start, he started not showing up. And the director okay. of, the, of the radio station said, you know, we're going to fire this guy. And I said, yep. well, I'm not going to get involved. And I told him, I said, you know, you need to take care of your position uh -huh. or they're going to let you go. Yeah. So yeah. he eventually got let go. And the director uh -huh. comes out to me. And I remember, I just came in as a sub. And he right. says to me, we want you to you're take over the show. You're new to the business. Yeah, yes. you're new to the business. And they're saying, here, take this over. Yeah. We want you to take over the show. And uh -huh. we, we think you're going to do a good job because we've heard you so far. And, you know, you kind of seem to know your way around this. Okay, great. So I started doing it alone for the first half of the year or year. And then mm -hmm. I brought in one guy who was a friend of mine who just kept showing up for whatever reason. Like, he wanted to be on the show. And so uh -huh. eventually I just threw him on the show. And then now cool. It, cool. it grew to five people on the show. And then the COVID thing hit. And then it was like, okay, we can't go to the station anymore. Okay. We, But, but they still want the show. That's what's so funny. They still right, wanted the show. Yeah. I mean, there's still a radio station. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So we're they like, okay. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So luckily, not everybody yeah. has this possibility mm -hmm. but i have a, a studio so i was able to do the show in my studio and then broadcast it for, for everybody so right. so far by the end of this year if things go the way i think they are there'll be 40 shows that i will have recorded at my home studio that wow. will be broadcasted in five countries and to a listening ship of at least one hundred and fifty thousand. 
And that's, that's awesome. Yeah. That's so pretty good. Is is that the the listenership that you've been able to determine from? Yes, uh, based on yeah. the five radio stations that listen to that broadcast us, that syndicate us, their listening ship, and then adding them all up together, it's not a million. Yeah. But <laughs> right. if it was just ten people, that's ten people who are listening uh-huh. to your every word and trying to make sure that they <laughs> like the musical taste that you have. Right. Right, right, and you get to be a bit of a tastemaker in the process. You're you're introducing people to Spanish rock that they haven't heard, right? I mean, all the time, all the time. Yeah. There is so much new music out there that I haven't even been able to like. I think I'm on top of things, and then I hear that ten new albums came out, and I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> so I'm always on my toes with Spanish mm-hmm. rock. It it continues sure. to grow. It continues mm-hmm. to create new uh, genres, uh, new ventures of bands, and so I'm, it's right. it's a it's a relentless pursuit of new music. Right. So, do you find that you're diving, you know, deep into the entire world of Spanish language music, pop, rock, uh, helps you when you go back to the studio to produce another band? It, Does it that does. feed back into each other? I yeah, I try to make sure that it does because. What you do when you listen to bands now and, and you're producing now, let's say, mm-hmm. is yeah. it's like when I do carpentry. When I go into your house without even wanting to, I'm looking at your woodwork. I'm looking at your doors. I'm looking at your windows. It's just habit. That's mm-hmm. what I do mm-hmm. for a living, right? right. So right. when I listen to a song now, I'm not just listening to the lyrics and listening to the chord progressions. I'm listening to the production. Mm-hmm. And so you can't get away from that now. Everything's production yeah. in my ear. And so yep. when I'm listening to a song, I'm going, okay, that's a okay. lot of bass, or that's not enough guitars, or wow, that was a weird chord change, or how he sang that was really cool, or whatever. And so right. you, you, you come in, and when people go, well, how do you know that? Well, I listen to a lot of bands in Spanish right. rock. It's not mm-hmm, just, you mm-hmm. know, I'm going, well, this is my opinion. You see a trend with how really successful bands are writing or at least producing their music. And you right. see a style that's more 2020 or you see a sort of a way that mm-hmm. things are done that's more modern. It also helps shape how you should produce your music, which is, you know, kind of mm-hmm. like what I try to do. Keep up yeah. to date with styles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you, you, you do a lot of these collaborations. I, I'm interested in that. Do you, do you enjoy working in pairs or in groups or how does that work best for you? You mean the, what, the production or the... Uh, yeah, the production. Yeah. I like to work alone. <laughs> That's the <laughs> truth. I do. So you, you, somebody brings you a song and you sit with it and work with it and wrestle with it individually? Yes. Uh, what I do is um, I listen to the song a couple, a couple of times in my car mm-hmm. or wherever. And then what I try to do is say, okay, I always start with drums for some reason. I always mm-hmm. want to change the drums. To see if sure. the drums create a different flavor, but I'm trying to find the, the spirit of the song. Every song has a spirit, mm-hmm. in my opinion, uh-huh, and, uh-huh. and then I think production fits to that. It plays to that. It, if yours, the spirit of the song is anger, then you want the song to sound like anger. If the spirit of the song is pain, you want the song to sound like pain. I just don't be, like. I'll give you a great example. When uh-huh. George Martin heard the song yesterday by Paul McCartney, he said to him, "I hear violins." And Paul was mm-hmm. insulted, it seemed, by that suggestion. Of, How could you hear violins <laughs> sure. in my song? You know, but he goes, right. "No, I, I really, yeah. yeah, I hear violins." <laughs> so George Martin did what he wanted to do based on what the spirit of the song was calling for, and Paul trusted mm-hmm. him, mm-hmm. which is amazing because you know this yeah. is a rock guy, right? But yeah. believe it or not, yeah. it became one of the biggest sellers in Beatles history. So. You have to sometimes go with that guy. To this day, the most covered song in the world. <laughs> well, I would have to say that he was right. And so yeah. you find the uh-huh. spirit of every song and you try to enhance that because it's in there. It's, it's whatever the animal right. that song is. If it's a tiger, you go with the tiger. But when you try to force your production style on the song, that's where I think you fail. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, you let the artist lead, right. but you have to uh, compliment the artist in a way. Right, right. Well, fantastic. Uh, Armando, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, chat with us today to, to sort of wrap things up. Do you have plans for the next year, you know, sort of as, as the pandemic drags on, you know, uh, what, what are your, what does the future look like for you as an artist? Okay. Well, let's start off with the fact that I'll still be doing the radio show unless I die. 
Uh, as far as the <laughs> okay. production, well, I hope I'm you don't die. Hope you're uh, still well, doing the show. Yeah. You know, we have our plans. God has His plans. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I am working right now with a heavy metal trash band that is sort of trying to complete an EP by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. I also mm-hmm. have. I just finished an EP for a female artist. Um, hopefully, something happens with this EP before the year ends because I want to have some hope that we can continue to work together. And then mm-hmm. next mm-hmm. year. What I'd like to do is continue to find new artists to work with and sort of develop. But I'm also even considering maybe even managing. But I'm not hmm. sure yet. You I know, see. That takes yeah. a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So, so you, you, you're finding different ways to be uh, supportive of the younger artists that are coming along and uh, producing, possibly managing, spreading the, spreading the love on the radio. Exactly. And, and trying to hit all the different avenues of music, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I hope, I hope everything goes swimmingly for you, and uh, we'll talk again soon. Well, listen, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the uh, platform, and uh, you take care of that. You too. The 52 Sketches podcast is a product of 52 Sketches, makers of earlywords.io, daily, private, stream of consciousness writing to clear your mind and unlock your creativity. Now, Ayla's Storm, We Need the Night, co-written and produced by our guest, Armando Posada. Mm-hmm.